Welcome to the Mark Jackson Show, brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Be sure to click the link in the description below to participate. Lou, I had to get that out of the way, pay some bills, because we have a special, special guest today. A legend from Hollis, Queens. My brother, we go way back. <laughs> Stephen A. Smith. What's up, baby? Welcome, man. Good to see you, my man. Good to What's see you. On, bro? How you doing, man? Did we do all right? You did good, man. You did good. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, you introed it like, you know, we were starting off a game. You know, I mean, it's just, I tell you, you got a lot more energy than you be showing at the beginning. You know, so you take the first quarter and treat it like it's the fourth quarter. You'd be perfect. But you know, if I was announcing the starting lineup, you got to be the last dude announced. I do that. I do. I, I, do feel that way. I do feel that way. No question. <laughs> What's going on, bro? Everything's How you doing, good. man? I, I, you have propelled a lot of shows being the first guest. Our very own legends and Cam and Mace, you went yeah. on and supported those guys, yep. propelled them to greatness. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here representing the Mark Jackson Show. Like I said, we go way back. We go way back, man. And, you know, listen, it's, it's nothing different than you and other people have done for me. You know, I'm a little reporter covering high school and colleges, ultimately coming to the pros. And, you know, I'm one of those guys I remember, man. It's people like yourself, Isaiah Thomas and others. I woke up to y'all. I got a microphone or rather a tape recorder in my hand. I'm a newspaper reporter. Anytime I needed to talk to you, you talked to me. You was always guiding me, letting me know about the sport of basketball, teaching me about what I didn't know even when you didn't realize that you were teaching. And so I remember you, Kenny Smith, Rod Strickland. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so, you know, you pay it forward, trying to look out for those on the come up, but also reaching back and making sure that you remind folks who did for you that you remembered what they did for you. That's the truth. Before I ask this question, sure. I know I said it before we sat down. Yeah. I want to say thank you, yeah. uh, just on the record, for the love that you've shown my father over yeah. the years, yeah. um, your stance as a man, the respect that you've garnered in your work field and your mm -hmm. career, yeah. and um, just who you are, somebody of your stature, yeah. speaking up for somebody like my father, uh, has done more than and even words can, can uh, explain today. So I just yeah. want to start off by saying I appreciate you. Yeah, your father's family to me. Yeah. Your uncle was family to me. Yes. I knew your brother well, you know, so I mean, it's like we, we go way, way, way back. I didn't know them like that growing up. I knew them from afar, from a distance. I used to watch them playing up on a uh, the park. They were playing. I was trying to play. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? I was trying to play. They were actually playing and stuff like this. City College, you know, up there on 145th and Convent Ave and the whole bit, and we used to see each other in the neighborhood and stuff like that, but once again, you know, you're from the neighborhood and stuff, and you you see people and the kind of relationships you cultivate. Our relationship grew more and more throughout the years because of the kind of man your, your dad has been and has always continued to be, not just to me, but to many, many, many others in the industry. So I'm, I'm proud to call him my brother. Absolutely. We're going to call this the OG hour. How about that? And we're going to teach the I ain't that old, but this, I got you. He's I a rookie. You. He's a rookie. <laughs> yeah. So you got to get There's donuts go. and coffee that's and all right, that that's stuff. Right, that's right. We're we going to call it because we, mm -hmm. he's going to learn something from this too. Sure. My question to you is growing up and in, in where we grew up, I know this is dear to you and true to you yeah. because I I grew up with a mom and a dad, yep. but mom was my number one cheerleader. That's right. Talk to me about the impact that your mother had on your life. She was my everything, man. She passed away in 2017 and, you know, it's something that you never get over. Um, but, you know, she raised me to be strong and to survive without her. That's what she told me. And, you know, in her dying days, she just let me know, you know, you were, I raised you, I ain't raised you to fold when I'm gone. You know what you have to do. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know what your responsibilities are. But my mother was my biggest cheerleader, being in the fourth grade, getting left back with a first grade reading level, undiagnosed, undiagnosed dyslexia and struggling in school and whatever, kids laughing at you, people thinking you were dumb, stuff like that, having to overcome all those odds. My own dad felt that there was no hope. I was in the fourth grade. My father looked at my father looked my mother dead in the face in the kitchen like, He's a lost cause. He's just not smart. He ain't going nowhere and stuff like that. My mother refused to buy into it, refused to believe it, constantly believing in me and pushing me to be the best that I can be, knowing the level of ambition I was going to have when I heard that. And, um, you know, she's, you know, I, I can, anything that's good about me, I give her all the, all the glory and, of course, to God himself because nobody deserves it more than those two. And so... I recognize that and I understand it and it's something that I try to live up to. I fall short, no doubt, from time to time. There's no question about that. But, you know, I, I in terms of my heart being in the right place, I'll put myself up there with anybody because I really, really don't wish harm or mean harm or whatever. But I am a guy that tells it like it is. I've always been that kind of person. 
And my mother in my latter in her latter years used to be so uncomfortable that I didn't with a West Indian accent, I didn't have to raise you that way. Where are you doing that? <laughs> and I would be like, Mom, I'm in journalism. We used to watch TV, we used to read the newspapers and stuff like that. We saw people, we saw things, we thought they were lying, we thought they weren't telling the truth. And I remember when I said, if I ever get into this industry, the one peop thing people are gonna know about me is that when they see or hear me say something, they gonna know I mean what I say. They gonna know I'm not faking it. Unless, of course, I'm acting on General Hospital or something. That's it. That's Brick, right? That's Brick. Right. Yeah, that's Brick. That's Brick, that's brick on General Hospital. For the mob. Out, you're getting Surveillance the expert for the mob. Yeah, that's me. That's me. Yeah, I, I didn't know you had that gangster, so I'm used to the smooth dude. Brick, oh, brick is totally different. I love it, man. You're I acting. love it. I love How it. How long has it been? Um, I've been on General Hospital for the last seven years or so. Um, I showed up, made an appearance, because I've been watching the soap since I was eight years old. I'm the youngest of six. And I used to come home, and my sisters and everybody, if you wanted to watch TV, you had to watch General Hospital. If you wasn't willing to watch General Hospital, you had to go do your homework. Because I wasn't allowed to go outside and play until I had to do my homework. So if I'm in the house, and if I didn't want to do my homework, I could watch General Hospital. And I never wanted to do my homework after I got straight home from school. So I would watch General Hospital, and it just clicked. I'm talking about Luke and Laura, Frank Smith and the Weather Machine, the cast of Luke and Laura had I mean, it on lock. It was crazy. It was, they had it on lock. And I... No, was watching. Who, who, I'm sorry. We said this to OG Allen. You, you, you wouldn't know. You were, you're too young. You're too young. You wouldn't know any better. But I'm telling you, it was like, it was the joint. I mean, General Hospital was it. And it was since I was eight years old. Wow. And I've been watching it ever since. So when they asked me years ago to make a cameo appearance, you know, show up. And then they said, it's not really a cameo. We got this character. We just want to see you in this role. And I did it. And the star of the show was like, you were fantastic. And then the executive producer, Frank Valentini, came running downstairs. He says, do you have time to do this? So what are you talking about? He said, with your busy schedule. I said, I can make time, and get down, and get down out to California periodically. He said, we want to make this a recurring role for you. And that's how it happened. And I've been doing it ever since. So. I don't, I don't want to glaze over because, I mean, it's going to be a, quite a while with you because you throw nuggets and nuggets and <laughs> opportunity for people to learn. But I don't want to glaze over the fact what you just gave a nugget because somebody's sitting there being discouraged, feel like no life is being spoken to them. Right. Tell me how you felt when you heard the words come out of your father's mouth speaking against you and your dreams. you devastated. Devastation, feeling defeated, um, feeling like there was validation of what he was saying that, you know, I just wasn't smart. And wondering if I was ever going to be somebody. And, uh, you know, when, when you're that age and you're growing up in the streets and, you know, you got drug dealers at every corner and stuff like that, temptations calling, you think about putting money in your pocket, all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to lose anyway. I'm not, you know, he doesn't think much of me anyway. And you remember that, but my mother wasn't having it. My mother was like, nah, that's nonsense. He's not, he's not dumb at all and, and, and what have you. And she, you know, her belief in me was what ultimately changed and shifted my emotion from be feeling so stung and so hurt to ultimately becoming defiant. And I think that where whatever ambition that I've had, that I've ever been able to point to in my life started from that moment. You know, for me, when he, when he doubted me like that and he said those words, I held on to it forever. I mean, it's... What is it? It's, it's almost 50 years later. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember where I was standing on the back porch. I remember looking through that, that window, connecting the kitchen from the back porch. I remember the look on his face when he said it to my mother. I remember how aghast my mother looked when she turned around and noticed that I had seen and heard him say what he said. And I remember the level of indifference and just aloofness towards, at, that he had towards me. Like, yeah, I said it. He didn't say that, but that was a look that he put on his face. Yeah, I said it and I meant it and turned his back and walked away. And from that moment forward, man, my level of determination and anything that I've elected to do, you know, I just, I don't know how to say it other than to say I don't stop. I, I just don't stop. It's like I'm on my grind. It's constant. And it's a voice that I hear in my head every day. How did that make you a better man and a better father? Well, it was easy for me to be a better man because I didn't think much of him as a man. Um, I knew he was my father. I knew I had love for him. But my thing is, and I was always different from my sisters. And, and again, you sort of knew it when you were younger, but it reached fruition later on in life. It was crystallized in your brain. 
the infidelity, the womanizing, the, the drinking, the smoking, the gambling, and all of this other stuff. But there were so many times when my mother was just grinding and grinding and having to work and she was never home because she was putting in 16 hours a day, seven days a week. She was working at Queens General Hospital right down the block from your alma mater, St. John's, and then right down the block from there, going from across the General, Queens General Hospital. This is the Grand Central Parkway, as you well know. Queens General Hospital is on this side, going towards Union Turnpike and stuff like that. Parsons Boulevard and all of that stuff is on this side. So Queen General Hospital is where she was working during the day. And then out in the evening time from five o'clock on to damn near midnight, she was working at the nursing home about a half mile down the block, crossing, going across Grand Central Parkway towards Parsons Boulevard. And um, she was doing that. And we was like, why she got to do all this? Why she got to do all of this? And then it didn't take long for us to learn is because she had to pay the bills because he wasn't doing it. And so for me, it was like, okay, I gotta be the man of the house. I gotta make sure that I'm, I'm gonna be successful in school. I gotta make sure that I do something that makes a success out of my life so my mother doesn't have to do what she's doing. And my mother, you know, God bless her, she was like, don't think for one second that I want you out there doing something illegal. It's not gonna fly with me. You're not gonna be welcomed in this home. And again, in her West End accent, she'd be like, you're going to jail. She said, <laughs> she says, she said you're going to jail. I would never visit you. I would never visit you. You know, and she would say stuff like that all the time. And I'm like, all right, mom, all right, all right, all right. And I would just fly straight. And then from that day forward, I was just on my grind and determined to overcome whatever maladies I had with reading deficiencies and stuff like that. Next door neighbor by the name of Tiver, along with my sister, Linda, literally taught me how to read and write. And that's how I was able to overcome what I overcame. That's the beautiful part is your dad made a statement totally out of line, but in his statement was some truth. Mm -hmm. You owned that truth yeah. and flourished out of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, he was, you know, he wasn't saying it to challenge me, but ultimately it was the ultimate challenge because I had to validate my mother's belief in me. Um, and I also had to put myself in a position where I was going to be successful. My brother had left when he was 17 to join the armed services, went to the army. Um, so he got the hell out of there as soon as he possibly could. I was the only boy in the house with my four older sisters. And I just had to make sure that prioritize and making something of myself. So my vision was clear. And, you know, even though I would be on the basketball court playing and all of this other stuff, in the end, the thing that I feared most was somebody calling me a dummy and being right. So I went about the business of educating myself every single day, even to this day when people talk about my vocabulary. If there's a word that I'm reading and I don't understand it, to this day, I'll grab the dictionary and I'll look the word up and I'll look at the context in which it's used. And then I'll memorize that and how it's been used to elevate my vocabulary. I do that to this very day. And it started the day I heard that from him in the kitchen. Wow, that's awesome. One of my greatest accomplishments, achievements, was being able to buy my mom and dad a house mm -hmm. when I made it, retire my mom. Right. How did that feeling come when, when your time came to take care of mom? Well, unfortunately for me, it came too late. In 2005, when ESPN gave me the show, quite frankly, on ESPN2, I was paid $1.3 million. And so after taxes, you cut it in half, like six seventy five, whatever it is, you know. And so I'm sitting there like, okay, it's still a pretty penny. Um, it's more than I ever thought I would make. And I remember it was in April of 2005. I signed a contract at like 3.30 in the afternoon. It was at the ABC building on 66th in Columbus. And I got in my car and I drove straight to Queens to the PAL on 200th and 112th Absolutely. Avenue. That's right, right down the block from you. And my mother was working in it. She had retired by this time, but she was still living off her pension. And because she didn't want to blow everything there, she would work at the PAL with the bingo nights and all of this <laughs> other stuff. And she was working there like five, six days a week just to save money to go on vacation and stuff like that. And I drove there and I grabbed her and the person running the center was looking at her. And I said, my mother won't be back. She won't be working here no more. And I drove her home and she's like, what you doing? I told her about the contract and I pulled out of my pocket. It was a two week cruise through Europe. And I said, go and enjoy your life. I got it from here. And so that was the best that I could do at that moment. 
And then in 2018 was when I got my big contract from ESPN. And that was bittersweet because she had passed away a year earlier. And that money was the money that I could have got a house in St. Thomas. You got a house anywhere, a couple of houses. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was, I I mean, she was, she would have been straight, you know? And so it was, it was kind of sad. And my sister, it was like, it's amazing how when you got siblings and there's a connection, like I'm cool with all of my sisters, but my sister Carmen and I are especially close. She's my youngest, even though I'm the youngest of six, she's my youngest sister, but she's four years older than me. And she just, everybody was celebrating, you know, I went home and signed a contract and, my sister looked at me and she was like, she just grabbed me and pulled me outside because she knew what I was feeling. And I was like, man, you know, mom is supposed to be here for this. Because what I would have done was I would have gotten on the plane, flew straight to St. Thomas, and I would have bought property in St. Thomas. Then I would have flew home and I would have said, it's a wrap. You leave in Hollis right now. It's time for you to go back home and enjoy the rest of your life. That was my dream. And that was something I wasn't able to fulfill because she passed away a year earlier. With her accent, because you do a great impersonation of how would she have thanked you? She, she, went and she was like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Wait, wait, where are we going? Why? What do you, what do you, what do you need? What, what are we doing here? And then I would have took it. She's like, what are you doing that for? That's too much money. You don't need, you don't need to spend all of that money. I didn't raise you that way. And then I would, she would have read the news, even though they never get it right. But she would have read the news about approximately what I would have been earning. And then she would have been like, okay. <laughs> that's what she would have done. So that's now, what I now is, is that Foster and Laurie, P.A.L. that she worked at? Say what? Foster and Laurie, the P.A.L. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, that's one, in the neighborhood. Two, I didn't know your mom's one, worked one, there. One twelve and two, one twelfth Avenue and Two Hundred Street. That's where I went to P.A.L. All that's the time. unbelievable. That's right. That's we used to go there. We used to go there in the wintertime, and in the wintertime, and in the summertime, we didn't bother because we'd go to O'Connell Park. That's right. We'd go between O'Connell Park, Jamaica Park. A lot of us was at 192, but that was only half court. They didn't have full court in, in Hollis. They had the full court in Jamaica and O'Connell Park, and that's where we would go. O'Connell Park. That's right. The legendary park where I grew up dreaming. Talk about the runs and the, and the type of, on a regular day, how we would experience Man, the competition. Sure. Well, well, here's the deal. You had to, it wasn't as crazy back then as it is now, unfortunately. Uh, with what we see now, but listen, man, you runs were serious because if you lost, you had to wait hours before you got back on the court because I mean, you wasn't. It, it was like that, you know. All right, I got my crew, I got my five, you got your five. You had about a lot, about twenty different teams waiting to go next, and if you didn't handle your business and you lost, you might as well well no, go home or go to a different park because. You wasn't going to do it. Everybody playing against you, they ain't going to win. Boo Harvey would show up there sometimes. You know, he, he was a bad brother right there. We knew what he was going to do. He started Jackson, and ultimately went to St. John's for a little bit, the whole bit. But most of the time, you know, we traveled. You know, him, he was, you know, he was wreaking havoc throughout the city. So everybody knew him. Some of us who could ball but not nearly as good. we go to Staten Island. we go to West 4th. we go to 135th and, and, and um, uh, you know, with Malcolm X Boulevard. Now we go all over the place and stuff like that. But... I'm telling you, it was the runs in Queens was nice, no doubt about that. It's just that I I, I only won at O'Connell like twice. <laughs> you won more than twice. I, I, two I times. Won, Come I, on, I won about two times, bro. Come on, man. I won about two because you know why? Because my boys that could play, they never ever wanted to go there. They always wanted to stay their lazy behinds and hollers or go to Jamaica because the honeys was over in yeah. Jamaica. Yeah. So they wanted to go to Jamaica. Y'all and stuff. had the lights too. That's right. We had yeah. the lights, but I was like, I was like, wait a minute. Now there's some honeys in, 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 in O'Connell too, because that's right, that's right in the Cambria Heights. That's on the way. They don't know what y'all missing. You know, what I'm they were they weren't trying to hear it, and they didn't want to go over there. And so I had to just get anybody once I got there, and I lost. I won twice. Twice. I won twice. I'm talking about full court five on five. There's a lot of half court games went on, but full court I only won twice, two times. At O'Connell Park. The competition was incredible. Well, no doubt. And you had no to doubt. have game. I remember being young. Yeah. My brother make the shot to pick the teams. Dude picked four dudes and left me off. Every time he was like, I got I you next. I got you. Yeah, got you never, next. Never they picked you me. I'm like, I got to step. My, my own brother didn't pick me. That's right. That's right. But that's but how serious that's the run right. was. Exactly. It was no family loyalty, none of that. You know, the best play. Who going to help me stay on the court today until I'm ready to leave? And then you pick a squad if you really wanted If you really wanted to leave eventually. You'd be like, he could go. you get somebody else. Stuff, knowing you're probably going to lose, but you didn't want to quit. So you just say, all right, I can lose this game and go on. 
I'm soaking it up, man. Okay, okay. you're looking at me. I'm, I, this is OG hour. I'm learning everything I can. <laughs> <laughs> I see you brush on the area, but it was serious. Yeah. The the uh, temptations, dice game on one side, no doubt. drugs on the other, guys up to no good on one side. I mean, yes. How was you able to handle it and say no to it? Believe it or not, man, it was like, um, first of all, I knew everybody from both sides. You know, I've never been one. Obviously, you do the crime, you got to do the time. And I got that part. But when you looked at the circumstances some people were dealing with, they weren't blessed to have my mom. They weren't blessed to have my sisters. You know, you had some cats that's in Hollis and, and Murdoch and Cambria and, you know, all the surrounding areas, Jamaica and everywhere else in Hollis. You know, all they had was themselves. And you had, people didn't realize that you had you know, some of the, you know, the grown ups, they were, they were drug addicts. They, you know, they were committing crimes. They were doing all types of stuff and people didn't take that into consideration. And so one of the good, one of the things that I was very big about, I wasn't judging. I might not want to be involved in some stuff. I might not want to be near it, but I didn't judge you for it. The only time I've ever been judgmental, believe it or not, with anybody is when they harmed other people. Like when, you know, you, 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 you like you literally, you killing somebody, you assaulted somebody, something like that. Nah, I didn't want to mess with you. I didn't want you around me at all. But if you were in that game, I mean, listen, for me, growing up in Hollis, I'm going to tell you where I was most indebted. And I wrote this in my book, Straight Shooter. Uh, you know, I New talk York about Times it. bestseller, by yes, the way. Sir. Thank you very much. I was like, yo, the drug dealer saved my life. I mean, I would come up in there. I would go in the park. And the only street light, the only light in the park was a street light right across the street on 204th Street in Hollis Avenue. And the light emanating from that corner right by the library would beam into the park. And that's the only way you could see. So I used to shoot like two, 300 jump shots a night when that was the only light in there, which is how I improved my jump shot. But I was the only one that the dealers allowed to stay in the park because that's where they was doing their thing. And they would be like, all right, we ain't going to do it until this time. And, you know, the cats that were running things would instruct all of them, leave them alone, don't bother them, let him do his thing. And so they would let me sit out there and practice and shoot until it was time for them to start doing their thing. Then they would be like, little man, you got to go home. And then I would go home from there. They didn't have to do that. And so, and then you had other cats that try to get you, they try to recruit you and get you involved. First, they're going to start out by coming to you, telling you to stand on the corner, do it, be on the lookout, you know, watch for 5-0, all of that other stuff. Other times they would come to you and they probably give you a nickel bag or whatever at the time and they'd be telling you, go ahead and do this or that. Those dealers wasn't having that. I was not to be touched. I was not to be messed with. I was not to be influenced. Leave him alone. Because they always viewed me as they told me. They told they said I was militant, even back then. They were like, you gonna, you gonna fight for us one day. Talking about black folks overall, period. They were like, you gonna be, you gonna do something where you fight in on our behalf. They didn't know whether I was gonna be a lawyer, I was gonna be in the media, but they knew I was gonna do something. And they they were like, he is not to be touched. And nobody bothered me because of that. So I always give those cats those props because I remember this, and I've said this on many, many occasions to people. If you knew, if you truly, truly know anything about the streets, real hardcore street cats despise wannabes. Now, they understand there's certain cats that are caught up and they just got to do what they got to do. But if you have an opportunity to be something greater and you don't take advantage of it, they have no respect for you because you choosing this when you don't have to. They like in their eyes, we have to do this to survive. You don't. You just trying to be something you not. And they don't respect it. It's like my whole point is you can see a lot of hardcore cats or trying guys trying to be hardcore. And I'd look at them and be like, I get more respect than you because I know my lane. I know I'm not that and I'm not trying to be that. And they respect that rather than you trying to be a part of a game. You know, you got no business being a part. And I was never that guy, and they always respected that. Well, the, the, the guys that made it, professional athletes, we watched them try to be gangsters. Stupid. Stupid. And the gangsters can't stand them. Right. They just use them because they're like, what, what's wrong with you? What's, what, what, is, what is wrong with you? You know, I mean, some of the cats that I grew up with, I mean, look, I, I, I grew up with a couple of, listen, half my friends are dead. You know, another quarter of them was in and out of jail. And a quarter of them was legit. 
All right. And God rest their souls, the ones that are gone and the ones that are in jail had to go to jail, whatever. Right? It's, it's, it's a few dudes that did eight and a third, if not more, that I grew up with. Listen, I know them to this very day. Now, I got love for them because of what they meant to me. You need tickets to a game. I got you. You know what I'm saying? You need something. I got you. But you can't hang with me. Right. Because we live in two different worlds and I can't bring you into my world. You understand? That cannot happen. I grew up with you. I know you. I'm never going to disrespect you like acting like I don't know you. That would break their heart. That would make them want to kill you. And they should because it's like, damn, you shouldn't. I'm not saying they should want to kill somebody. But, you know, to grow up with you and for you to act like you don't know them, that's problematic. That's very insulting because you got to remember, these cats have gone through a lot. And, yeah, they've made a lot of wrong decisions or whatever, but they've gone through a lot of things. And to know what they've gone through, it means the world to them for somebody to be where I'm sitting right now and for me to just acknowledge them, to see him and give him a hug. How you doing? Everything's all right. You good? It's no problem. That's all you have to do. Don't be disrespectful and dismissive of them. But in the same breath, that don't mean we can hang together. That don't mean I'm going to bring you into my world. It doesn't mean that I'm going to subject you to that kind of thing because you made decisions that you can't come back from in that regard. And I'm never going to associate myself with that. Right. If I would have, I would have done it when I was younger. And these are guys... These aren't made up stories because no. we, we, we're both from the same neighborhood. Yes. So people that we're very familiar with. Very. That, uh, that supported us and made sure hands off when it comes to right. those guys or those individuals because they spot talent. They spot people that's living for a purpose and a dream. Yep. And uh, shout out to those guys that covered us. Absolutely. When it could have went the other way. It could have went the other way. We could have went the other way if it were not for them. And that's why I'm not, I'm, I'm unapologetic when it comes to me saying, listen, I don't see them, I don't hang with them, don't really talk to them, it's very, very rare, but I will always have love for those brothers that preserved my life. I wouldn't be where I am today if they didn't put the heavy hand down to make sure I was shielded from all of that, even if it meant putting a heavy hand on me to make sure I didn't choose to go that route. They made sure of it and they saved me from a dead end life. All the things you do going back to the community to show love and support, depositing back into that uh, scholarships, mm -hmm. the money you've raised and the money you've given. Talk about that, how important that is. I went to an HBCU, Winston-Salem State University, uh, Clarence Big House Gaines, legendary coach, what have you, and uh, his mentor was John B. McGlendon, who learned the game under the great James Naismith, he invented the fast break and all of this other stuff, and um, he used to be at numerous practices when I was at Winston-Salem State. And these guys would teach me about life and talk to me about some of the trials and tribulations they had to endure, highlighting for me what real racism looked like, what real obstacles looked like, what real bigotry looked like, et cetera, et cetera, and how you got to maneuver your way through those minefields in order to get to where you want to go. And when they, would, when they would impart their words of wisdom upon me, they never asked for anything other than for me to remember what they did for me and in any way that I could to uplift HBCUs. It's all they cared about. Historically black colleges and universities matter. It matters to our community. It mattered so much more even back in the day. It still matters to this day. Don't forget your own and do what you can to elevate and build notoriety for HBCUs throughout this country. So. We're making sure that as many of the disenfranchised from our communities as there may be, that there's always an outlet of opportunity for them, just like we provided that for you. And so I made a promise to both of them and to Coach Gaines specifically face to face many, many years ago. And um, I just hold on to that promise that I made and I make sure that I try to live up to it to the best of my ability. So I've been fortunate enough where I've worked with HBCU Week and this woman by the, a wonderful woman by the name of Ashley Christopher, Mayor Persicki in the state of Delaware, um, in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, Senator uh, Kuhn, uh, that he's a senator, a Democratic senator from Delaware. He's done a tremendous job in assisting us, and uh, we've raised in excess of $70 million for over 12,000 students. So we're going to keep it going. And you actually took first take to, to HBC. Yes, right? I did. I took first take there. Uh, ESPN give them a lot of credit for that. They didn't have to do that. 
but Dave Roberts and, you know, John Skipper at the time, who was the boss, uh, you know, along with Mr. Iger, Bob Iger for Disney, they all gave the okay uh, for me to take the show to Delaware where Magic Johnson and Troy Vincent, the executive VP of the NFL, they both showed up as guests, as in-person guests. So that was a very, very big deal. And then after that, Disney got entrenched in it even more. Disney on the yard became associated with it in a very, very big way. And we ultimately went down to Orlando and did the show from there as well. And uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us in the future to do it. And then just just a few months ago, once I brought Shannon Sharp on board for first take, um, we took it to his alma mater. He was like, the one thing I would love is if you could take the show to my alma mater. He didn't know I was going to be able to do it or not, and I surprised him. And I got us to take the show to Savannah State, his alma mater. And then the next day, we went to my alma mater at Winston-Salem State. Y'all had two parties, though. Y'all were jamming yeah. both, yeah, both yeah, those episodes. Yeah, yeah, we had a good time. Yeah. We had a good time, no doubt. You got some fresh breaking news to give to the Mark Jackson show. Huh? On a new deal you just signed. Oh, right? nah, the streets man. are talking. Hey, hey, hey. We do our homework here. The yeah, I just, I just did a deal with iHeart uh, Radio. I mean, I already got my own YouTube channel, and um, but in terms of an audio component, I reached a deal with iHeart. So you know, they're the they're the top podcast distributor throughout the throughout the country, if not the world. And you know, they're doing big things, obviously. And so I'm going to be working in concert with them on the audio side. I still got the Stephen A. Smith show. On my, on my own channel on YouTube. And so that's good and that's really percolating. I'm picking up thousands of subscribers per day. So that's really good. But the biggest thing for me is that I own and operate it myself. It's not associated with ESPN or Disney or anybody else. It's owned and operated by me. And so that was something that was incredibly important to me. Anybody that's worked for Disney knows how those employee contracts look. You don't get that every day. Um, but I was fortunate that the bosses was uh, listening to me when I, they knew and that I insisted that that was something that I wanted to do. And in fairness to them, they kept their word because, you know, they told me it was something that they were willing to do before I agreed to my contract. It wasn't a part of my contract at the time. But even after I'd signed my contract and they had me dead to rights in writing, they remember that they gave me their word and they kept their word. And so I'm appreciative of that. Well, congratulations to you and salute for all you do yep. representing us and moving the, the needle forward. You know it. That's the goal. Going back to what you guys were talking about before, growing up, I know you said the people in your neighborhood could tell there was something different about you, mm -hmm. could tell that you would make an impact one day. Yeah. At what age did you realize I have a gift to communicate or, or a gift of gab? Well, my mother said that came out of the womb talking. She said I didn't have to wait. <laughs> That's what she says. Um, but, you know, it was a combination of a lot of things. My mother was very, very religious. She was an Episcopalian. Um, and I used to go to church and I used to listen to the sermons and I was bored to death. But it wasn't with the word. It was their delivery of the word. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been somebody that paid rapt attention to, you know, just how people spoke and how people were able to galvanize an audience, get an audience to listen to them. So that was one thing. But the other thing for me was that I grew up around a bunch of Muslims too, a bunch of black Muslims. Uh, you know, I remember the Ansar Law community in Brooklyn, New York. I knew a bunch of brothers uh, that was really, really into that and they would go over there on Bushwick Avenue and stuff like that. For me, it wasn't about religion, it was about black empowerment. And so I used to listen to that in the church. And sometimes it was a challenge because from a biblical perspective, you're looking at things and you're looking at it one way and give peace a chance. And that's the mentality and peace and tranquility and love for all. And on the other hand, you're thinking about this and you're thinking about the streets and you're thinking about the battles that you're going to have to fight. You're thinking about white America. You're thinking about how they'll pigeonhole and marginalize you and the challenges that you have to partake. How are you going to overcome this? So I used to listen to all of it, you know, and then it, it, it would go to another level because I'm talking about me. I'm in sixth grade or whatever, and I'm watching Nightline. I'm watching Ted Koppel. I'm watching Peter Jennings at six o'clock, you know, as I became a teenager and stuff like that. I'm looking at the Sunday shows, Meet the Press and all of these other shows and stuff like that. And then I'm, I'm reading Malcolm X, you know, the biography, and then I'm thinking about that, and I'm, and I'm thinking about him by any means necessary, whereas that wasn't necessarily the approach that Martin Luther King had because he preached about nonviolence. And it was that constant tug of war all the time. Well, what it did was make me alert 
and cognizant and politically conscientious about what was going on around me. So while other people were playing in the park and stuff like that, and then they would sit up there and they would go like, you know, violence would take place and all right, that just comes with it. I would try to analyze why. You know, if I'm sitting up there, yeah, you, you know, you pull out a gun, you point it at the cop, he need to take you out. You know what I'm saying? But if you unarmed, what'd he pull out his gun for? What'd he do it for? You know, all right, you, you sit up here, this person was fighting you and swinging at you, and that's why you threw that person to the ground. This person threw up their hands, Did, gave no resistance whatsoever, but you still treated them that way. Why? I would think about stuff like that. I would think about my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. McHugh. I'll never forget it as long as I live. They put me in detention, put the whole class in detention, and I was so disgusted that the detention teacher, I just looked at them. When I looked at, I looked at the detention teacher like that, Mrs. McHugh saw me look at her like that, literally grab, because I had a Michael Jackson afro, <laughs> and literally grab me by my afro. How dare you look at her? Like, and swinging my head around, something you can never get away with in this day and age. And I'm thinking about that. Like, this woman put her hands on me. This white woman put her hands on me. And I go home and I told my mother, and my mother's like, what did you do? <laughs> like, well, what? Like, what did you do? She didn't do it for no reason. You, did, you, you must have done something. And my mother, I would, later, I would learn later on in life, it wasn't about the teacher. It was about my mother teaching me to accept accountability for my role in anything while also teaching me life ain't always fair and you can't be caught up in what's fair and unfair because you'll never get ahead if all you're focused on is the unfairness of things. It doesn't work that way. And I think that strengthened me in my latter years, but I didn't realize it at the time. What's happening, man? How you doing, man? Everything good? It's always good. I'm with the fellas, man. It's all good. You know how I am. I, this, I, I can't stop smiling, man. I mean, <laughs> this, makes, this makes me happy, man. No, I just wanted to chime in and tell you, big bro, both y'all guys, my big brothers, and thank you, Stephen A., for stopping by. Uh, Mark, congratulations on everything you're doing. It's a privilege and an honor for uh, you giving me a chance to partner up with you, as I explained so many times. But I just wanted to tap in and tell you guys, both of you, I love you guys, and thank you so much, man. It's just great to watch it. And... Especially you, Stephen A. For because you and Mark have your own relationship, but for you to stop by my show, maybe about seven or eight episodes in, and give me some credibility to what I'm trying to do out here, it meant a lot mm -hmm. to me. And nobody, I, I know, I, I think it's you and Michael Strahan, neck for neck, who works harder. So <laughs> I, so I just wanted to tell both of you, thank you, and I'm not here to interrupt or anything like that. Just congratulations to you, Mark. And big shout out to you, Stephen. I just want to tell you guys thank you. All the best to you, man. You know I love you, man. You're love doing, and appreciate you, 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 you guys man. doing a great job, man. Been working hard and and doing your thing, man. So just keep on grinding and know the the higher you climb, they're gonna be coming for you. Dial That's it so back. Sad. Dial it back at that particular moment in time because in this day and age, they trying to bait you. That's all it is. They trying to bait yes, you. They yes, trying sir. to bait you. Don't fall for the bait because that's all thank they're trying you to so do. Much. Thank you so much. One thing before I get out of here. Yeah, what's man. going on with you with you and the Pelicans, Stephen A? What's happening, oh, man? <laughs> man, these brothers, these brothers. Well, first of all, first of all, I'm sitting there going like this. You know, they keep talking about I average one and a half points in college. It's actually less. I didn't play. I cracked my kneecap in half the second I got there. I mean, what, what are you talking about? So that's number one. But number two, it's like I'm looking at the Pelicans and I'm like, you talking about me. I'm 56 years old. This is the 80s. Meanwhile, You've been in existence for 22 <laughs> years. You got two names. You were the Hornets, and now you're the Pelicans. What number does that have in common with? That's the amount of playoff series you've won in 22 years. <laughs> two. Boom. You got just as many Boom. names as you got playoff series wins. You got one division title in 22 years. You ain't never been to a conference finals. You ain't never been to an NBA finals. But you focused on Stephen A. And by the way, since they opened their mouth, they've lost every game. <laughs> they've lost every game since they opened their mouth about me. So it's like I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there looking at them like, this is your damn problem. You ain't focused on the wrong things. You, are, you ain't focused on the right things. At the end of the day, I got a basketball scholarship. It paid for my education, which facilitated me being at the top of my game in this industry. That's where I'm living. Where y'all living. That's what I'm about. That's what it's about. And what I tell them is this, and not not nowhere near sports 
uh, analyst because I'm still brand new to this. But when it came to music and somebody that was in a certain field used to say something about the field I was in, I said, I'm an all-star. I'm a superstar in my field. Really? I, I, sold, I sold 20 million records total. Right. So I, in my craft, I'm the best at what I'm doing. In your craft, are you the best at what you're doing? And obviously you are. So that's, I'm just giving you some more ammo when somebody tried to come back at you. In my <laughs> field, I'm at the top of what I'm doing. Right. How about you? What are you doing in your field? Are you at the top of what you're doing? And so further notice, get back to me. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. That's all. But, but also, I let them say it. I let them show whatever they want to show. They're going to show a vid. I'm in a shirt and tie. James Harden let me shoot without warming up. I shoot an air ball. They're going to show that from 12 years ago. I'm like, look, I said, is that what you got? Go ahead. Right. And then you, you got, got this damn Kwame Brown talking. And I'm sitting there like, you talking about us talking about black people. All you do is talking about black people. You going over about black people every day. I ain't never talk about you personally. I ain't never talk about your family. I ain't never talk about you. I never would do that. All I said was, on the NBA level, you couldn't play. Now, I don't know anyone on the planet who would tell me that I'm wrong about what I said. Now, that was years ago. So it's like, I I'm sorry. I don't mean to be. I'm like, I apologize, bro. I'm sorry for telling the truth at the time. My, My bad. bad. I, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it to haunt you 15 years later. It's okay. I wish you nothing but the best. But every time I turn around, the brother keep talking about me. So I said, I guess I, tell, I guess that's going to get you clicks. So go ahead and get them. Gotcha. I didn't mean to interrupt, guys. I'm going to let you get back to what you're doing. I right. just want to shout both of you out, man. And y'all enjoy the rest of y'all afternoon. Right, man. Love and well. appreciate you. Anytime, bro. No doubt. Thank you. All right, love. I got to say, though, Kwame Brown played for me with the Golden State Warriors and was very good as a backup center and a starting center when we had no big. So... Great screen set, a great diver, and a, and a professional. Thank so you for telling me that. The experience I, I had with him was I won't fun. deny that. I was just saying that at the time in 2007, I said, I, I didn't know, Twitter didn't exist. I didn't know that this was going to become a meme and 15, 16 years later, right. people was going to be, I would have never done it. So, you know, listen, we all make mistakes in life. At the end of the day, I wish I wouldn't have spoken about him that way. I've apologized for it. But in the same breath, it's like, you're either going to forgive or you're not going to forgive. But if that's the way that you're going to be, that's fine. And it's, it's life. Anyway, so as you sit here, Mark, let me ask you this question. As you sit here and you think about all the things that you've accomplished in your career, what are you aiming to do now? I know you're doing this podcast and whatever, but, but there's always a bigger picture for you. What are you aiming to do now? That's a great question. And I'm loving what I'm doing right now, spending a lot of time at home, being around my family, my brand new grandson, mm -hmm. eight months old. It's a great thing. Um, there is a side of me, obviously, that still wants to coach. I still have unfinished business, whether that's professional rank or college rank, but I want to coach. I want to lead men and inspire men and finish the job that I started. Uh, so I look forward to that opportunity. And um, that's the next thing. For Where? I don't know. But it will happen, and I'm excited about the opportunity. Why do you believe, as we sit here today, so many of us, myself included, have speculated as to why you haven't gotten another head coaching job since you departed from the Golden State Warriors? Why do you believe you have not been hired as a head coach in the NBA all of these years, considering the success you had before you departed from Golden State? I will tell you, I'm not connected. And one thing I respect about you is your book's called Straight Shooter. I can remember having lunch with you last year, and you said, we were just talking about somebody else, and you right. said, if you got a problem with me, just tell me. Tell me you got a problem with me. Be straight with me, and then we could deal with it. And I'm sitting there like, this dude just finished saying something on first take on one of those shows that I know was wrong, mm -hmm. don't want to bring it up to him or not. And in a million years, I would never bring it up. I just let it die because we're still cool and right. it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't bother me. Right. But something said, tell him. And I sat there at the table with you and I said, I, I got one thing. You said something uh, the other day that wasn't true and then we talked about it. And then you said, it wasn't offensive, didn't be in, in attack mode. You said, you know what? I'm going to fix it. And it wasn't like, the thing I respect most, first of all, you took it, you owned it, you acknowledged it, and then you corrected it. Mm -hmm. The thing I love most is when you first said it, 
you were speaking the truth. Even though we was boys, and even though it didn't benefit me for you to say it, you were still speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in today's world mm -hmm. of covering. Mm -hmm. I can remember calling a particular well-known reporter when he wrote a story that was 1,000% inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I told him it was wrong. Yep. I know he knew it was wrong, and I asked him why did he write it. I said, old school, even though that's your guy, you stay away from the story. If I gotta write it, I gotta write the truth. That's right. I have not spoken to that man since. Right. And we've worked together, and there's no issue. I ain't gotta worry about me doing anything yep. crazy. That's not who I am, but I just know who you are. I respect the fact that you tell the truth. Whatever the truth is, I don't mean you, you can't be wrong, right. but in today's world, I can write a story about a coach that's mm -hmm. under 500 mm -hmm. and make him seem like yep. he's a genius put him in position to get another job. No. As opposed to you can write my story and I'm not connected and say I had nothing to do with it and I was bad when the evidence speaks against it. So I think that has something to do with it. Well, for me, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> Perfect example of that would be Doc Rivers today. Doc Rivers is the head coach of the Milwaukee Bucks. I've been friends with Doc Rivers for over 25 years. I look right into the camera and I said, this is it. Right or wrong, Maybe not this year because you arrived halfway through the season. <clears throat> but if you don't win by next season, I don't think Doc Rivers will ever be a head coach in the NBA again. I said that to him. To his face, as well as on TV. He knows I'm not wishing it for him. But in covering the sport, you have a job to do. And one of the things that, you know, speaking on a macro level that I'm very big about is, and I used to say this to Kobe Bryant, D. Wade and various others, especially the Allen Iverson, I will never say something public. Find out and discover I'm wrong, because it's rare I'm wrong. It's not, I'm not perfect, but it's rare I'm wrong. But I would never say something public that was wrong and, oh, I'm corrected privately. No, I said it wrong publicly. I'm going to go out publicly and say I was wrong because the goal shouldn't be trying to save face. The goal should be trying to be fair and accurate. That's our responsibility. And the other thing is, is that, and this is one of the things that I stand on on many occasions. I've had plenty of dudes despise me, hated my guts. And you know what I've always said to folks? Those are the people that don't talk to me. The people who talk to me don't feel that way about me. Because if you talk to me, you're going to know I'm going to be fair. And you're going to know that I will throw myself on a sword before I try to hold on to my pride and live in a lie. I'm not going to do that to anybody. And there's no player, there's no coach, there's no executive, there's no owner, there's no one that could ever look at me and say, he had an agenda of wishing that I failed. I don't want anybody to fail. I'm one of those people that there's room for everybody to get something. At this, you don't want, look at our society, look at the world that we live in right now. You know what the real problem is? You got cats that don't have much. And you have another race of folks that think that we aren't, we're losing everything. So you got, you got black folks and minorities in this country that are struggling because you're only as great as your weakest link. And then you have a white populace that once were dominant because they were about 87 to 90% of the population. They've now dwindled down to 60%. They're looking at open borders and things of this nature. And they're saying, what about us? What about us? We're losing our power and stuff like that. And you got problems going on because people are worried about themselves. But when you really, really are great as a team, as a people, as a nation, it's when you think beyond you for the greater good. And in what I do for my career and for my business, the greater good is making sure that under no circumstances can anybody look at me and say, he's unfair and he's inhumane and he doesn't care about how other people, are. that's why I would apologize. You know, it could be Kwame Brown, it could be anybody. It's like, if I'm wrong in any way, I'm sorry. What do you want me to do, correct it? But if I'm right, you gotta own that too. And that's what I try to live by. I guess my question to you, turning that same thing back, would be why do you think I don't have a head coaching job? Well, I thought it was what I thought it was because I was told, and then you <laughs> told me I was wrong. Um, but the fact that you don't have um, connections makes sense, but it's more broader than that. I think that the age of basketball has moved to analytics. And let me tell you why that's so important. 
When you think about analytics, think MIT, think institutions like that. Now think about an owner. Most owners don't know the sport that they own, that they own a team in. They know a little bit about it, but they don't know nearly as much as they think they do. Who enables them to think they're more knowledgeable than ever? The analytics dudes, because analytics is about numbers. And if the owners don't understand nothing else, they understand numbers because they're the ones paying the bills. They're the ones writing the check. So if I'm an owner and I find somebody that speaks my lingo, my language, my verbiage, then that's the person I want. Well, that person that I want that's associated with analytics, who are they hiring? They're hiring folks of their ilk. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're surrounding themselves with that. And because of that, that leaves former players, basketball minds with that sixth sense, that third eye out of the mix. It's not just because it's not a matter of you knowing analytics or not. It's about you not being a part of the culture. They're not. A, they are a part of. Then you combine that with your knowledge and your know how to debunk some of the theories they might try to throw in your direction. Not to mention the control they may try to exercise. Who you going to play? When you going to play them? How many minutes are you going to play them? Who you going to be in a rotation with? All of these different things. They're going to be averse to leaning on you and trusting you because you may have power and dominion that they don't want you to have. They want it for themselves. And that's how they're able to be in these situations. I personally believe that has a lot to do with you not having a head coaching job right now. And it makes sense, but I'll say to you, you cannot be part of a team that went to the playoffs one time in 19 years, turn it around, go two times in three years, win 50-plus games, win a playoff series, and propel a team mm -hmm. to four NBA championships having a little to do with it. You can't do that without analytics. You can't turn a team that historically was awful defensively and turn them to a top three defensive team in the league right. without analytics. So it's right. not ignoring it. It's, it's, it's about putting it in its proper But I'm not place. implying that you did. No, I get that. I, I'm saying to you that the people that are put in these positions of power, Correct. they come from a certain environment. And that environment, they hire their own. They hire the people that went to school with them. They hire the connections. You know, a lot of, we call it nepotism. It's a lot of that going on. And so that's what I'm saying. It's not questioning right. that. It's not. Pat Riley was using analytics in the '90s. Absolutely. He was doing that. Jimmy Jackson told me that. Absolutely. He's like, Pat Riley was doing analytics in the '90s. But Pat Riley had the power. Ultimately, got the power once he departed from the New York Knicks and he had the Miami Heat. And you think about the Riley culture, and nobody talks about the analytics, even though he has been utilizing it. You were utilizing it. A lot of people didn't talk about that. We see that. Why? Because the people in position. They don't want to popularize and promote and project that. They want to act like others are distant and apart other than the people they handpick to be in the roles they want them to be in. And I think that's a huge problem. A couple of things before we get out of here. Orange and blue skies. Yeah. yeah. How far are the New yeah. York Knicks yeah. going to go? Well, <laughs> with a healthy Julius Randle, OG Ananobi and Mitchell Robinson back in the lineup, I think the New York Knicks going to the conference finals. Without them, they ain't getting out of the second round. Might not even get out of the first round. Because I think that Julius Randle is that important to them. I think it's a lot to ask for Jalen Brunson to carry that stuff on his shoulders. Even though I will say I love the Bogdanovich pickup. Love that. Burks being your reserve guard because I know that Thibodeau is going to use him instead of running Jalen Brunson into the ground because he's a familiar guard that played under Thibodeau before. And I think that that would bode well for them. But I still think you need Julius Randle to get to the conference finals. Who's your favorite to go to the finals in the East and West? Boston. Who do you have winning it all? I got Boston in the East. Um, I don't like what I've seen from the Clippers as of late. I think Denver, you have to go with Denver. Um, I think Minnesota could give them a run for their money, but I don't think they're good enough offensively. I think Oklahoma City could give them a run for their money, but they don't have enough girth and they have no answer, zero answer for Jokic. Um, and because of that, I think that's problematic. I don't think Phoenix is good enough defensively. I don't think the Lakers shoot the ball well enough. I think that Dallas could score in bunches on anybody. I'm not sold on them defensively. Uh, Sacramento, they're just not there. Sabonis has good nights, bad nights, but I saw them in the playoffs last year. I'm not sold. Um, 
So and Golden State is just entirely too small. So I think that I would have to say, I hope this is not the case because I don't feel like going back to Denver. I would prefer <laughs> not to be in a mile high city in June. Um, but if I had to pick between uh, the, the, you know, the conference, it would be Boston and Denver. Now, I don't deserve this kind of cruelty because I love me some Damian Lillard, Dame Dollar all day, every day. And I think that as the season progresses, he's going to work his way out of the slump as he has been doing the last two games. And I think that he's going to remind us of who he is. But I'm a decent human being. I love the Lord and I try to be a decent man. <laughs> I, I don't deserve to be in that. Milwaukee and Denver in June. I deserve better than that. I don't deserve to be confined to those two cities for an NBA Finals. It's bad enough Adam Silver has had me in Cleveland, Utah, and Indianapolis the last three years for All-Star Weekend. To give me a Denver-Milwaukee Finals, that would hurt my heart. I, I don't deserve that. Give me Boston. It's close enough to New York. I can, I can fly there on game days. Okay, leave me alone. <laughs> Let me have a decent city or two to go to for the finals. That's all I ask. My dream scenario is L.A., Miami. But that only happened in the bubble. Go figure. You look like the type of guy that enjoys Miami. You've said it I a do, million times. I do. I do. It's very nice. Miami's been very, very good to me. Come back to us. Come back to us. <laughs> yes, I'm back. I'm back. You went to prom on 12 real quick. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah, that too. That too. That too. Who's yeah. the MVP as we speak? And sit here today. Believe it or not, I think it's Jason Tatum. I think that, um, listen, Jokic is phenomenal, and we know this. But when you look at Jason Tatum, he's the best player on the best team. He's averaging 27 a night. His teammate is making $304 million. And this brother is just on this kind of mission. And they're six games better than anybody else in the NBA. And so I look at it from that standpoint, at least five games better. Actually, I had a four-game lead on Minnesota Minnesota lost one, they won. So it's probably around five games. But I'm looking at Boston, and I'm like, they're jacking up too many threes. That makes me uncomfortable. But they seem unstoppable offensively. And Tatum and Brown are something to behold. Um, I got Shea Gilgis Alexander as my runner-up for MVP right now, and he's closing in. I mean, to have 41 games this year already um, where you've scored over 30 with – about 24, 25 games to go. I can't say enough about Shea Gilgis Alexander. This brother is, a, he's a special, special player. Anthony Edwards, I would say that, but Jokic has been creeping up on him. So I get that. But I had Embiid by a mile ahead of everybody before he went down. I've been thinking about this for a week now. I remember, in the, I'm a big sports fan, so baseball, I remember when they made the case that Ted Williams was the greatest living baseball player. Uh, when they had the All-Star game. So I've been thinking a week, and I put together the top five living basketball players today. What do you mean living? You mean pre presently playing or presently alive? I'm starting with Michael Jordan. Okay. Alive. Thank you. Definitely so, so. Michael Jordan for me. So, so let, me, let, me know, let me know if you disagree. Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, in no particular order. Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, LeBron James, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Larry Bird. Wow. Okay, um, Kareem, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, definitely. Um, gonna leave Tim Duncan out? Who you gonna knock off my list? You know. <laughs> Feel free. Lou, let me, you can let chime me, in. Let me, tell you, let, let me say this to you. You said Magic Johnson, right? Magic, Michael, Larry, LeBron, and Kareem. So I got Magic, I'm sorry, I got Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Those are my top three. Let me tell you where it gets a little dicey. You talk about Larry Bird. Okay. I can think about that. You said living. Okay. I can think about Larry Bird. I can think about Tim Duncan instead of Larry Bird. Um, but I would prefer Larry Bird because of that long-range sniper mentality. Okay, so that's four. Here's where it gets tricky. and You're the perfect person to talk to about this. I think that Magic Johnson is the greatest quintessential point guard in the history of basketball. He's a five-time champion, won a champion as a rookie, played center in that game six, 42 and 15. We know what he did to Caldwell Jones and Daryl Dawkins and them. We get it. But if we're talking about impact, how do we ignore Steph Curry? We didn't ignore him. Because here's, here's where my challenge is. I know 
if you are various analysts who talk about what a quintessential true point guard is supposed to be, right? Then I'm like, okay, I get where you're coming from. You're supposed to set up and facilitate opportunities for others. You would know this as one of the great point guards to ever play the game. I get that part. So in that regard, it's a no brain, it's magic. But when I think about impact in terms of the effect that you have on the players around you and an opposing defense, I believe that it's a viable debate to debate Magic Johnson and Steph Curry because Steph Curry is the greatest shooter God has ever created. He is a guy, as you well know, who is a threat the second he steps an inch past half court. He can pull up from 40 or 50 and kill you. This is who he is. And because of his shooting ability, his stamina, his ability to move without the basketball and to create his own shot, your head is constantly on a swivel. Wherever he is, you look like, where is he? You know, and you can't guard him one on one. You have to guard him as a team. You have to literally guard areas because no single individual can stay with him. Picks, the screens, his constant movement, his stamina. J.R. Smith said it on Instagram months ago when he said Matthew Della Vadova had to be hospitalized because they had to give him oxygen because he was running around from chasing Steph Curry so much he almost died. Now, think about that for a second. And so... Anybody that's run, if you out there and you run and you try to run, a, think about you running a marathon. Think about you even running on a treadmill where you're at your last breath. You're like, my God, that was Matthew Della Vadova having to chase him. That's not what magic did to you. And so, again, quintessential point guard magic, which I would agree with your top five. But if we talk an impact. I might have to replace Magic Johnson with Steph Curry. I'm not used to Stephen A. Dance. I'm just telling I mean, you. You bobbing and weaving right I'm now. I'm going to go magic. Okay. I'm going to go magic because old school and because the leadership, his teams never stunk. You know, even when Steph Curry was there, when Klay Thompson wasn't, they weren't the same. And that's what hurt Steph. Whereas magic, and not only that, I just don't feel, I ain't going to lie to you, man. I just don't feel like getting cussed out by Michael Jordan. Okay. I just don't. <laughs> Michael Jordan is that, yeah, when I start bringing, when I start bypassing old school dudes, for some new school dudes, Michael Jordan going to just going to call me. He's going to see this interview and he's going to call and cuss me out, man. He t actually texted you, right, when you made your, your pick. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does. He did. He did. He did. He did. Try to produce first take. You know what I'm saying? He's crazy. He's crazy. I mean, but, but I love him to death. But it's like, this is what they do, man, because you got these old you got these old cats and this is how they feel. But they're right. I get it. So I would go with magic. But whoever, you, whoever we mention in this discussion, you're going to leave out greats. To even be mentioned in this discussion is a heck of a compliment and the respect that we have for you, whether it's Steph Curry, Isaiah Thomas, Oscar Robinson, Tim Duncan, all the greats historically right. to be acknowledged. If Kevin Durant had won somewhere other than Golden State, I would have had to put Kevin Durant ahead of Bird. I got no problem with that, if he would have. But today I'm going with Bird. But right. speaking of all-time greats, I got to thank you again mm -hmm. for joining us, man. It's been an absolute privilege. This is not his last time. He will be back on the Mark Jackson Show. Thank you so much Stay for watching around around. on the Come and Talk to Me Network. Thank you again to Under, Underdog Fantasy. Thank you again to the legends, Cam and Mace. Continue to watch and support. Unbeloved. Blessings.